Sterophile Magazine senior contributing editor and AnalogPlanet.com editor, Michael Fremer is inarguably one of the most learned experts on vinyl and high-end audio turntables in the world, bar none, that's the fact, Jack. Many, 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 many years ago, when most people said vinyl was dead and CDs were our future, Michael knew better and held the flag aloft for vinyl long after most considered it dead through the dark ages of CDs up to about 2000. And Michael continued to hold the flag and write his columns for first The Absolute Sound and now Sterophile, uh, claiming that vinyl is the superior format, which I obviously agree with as I protest so loudly here on my channel and in my group, Jazz Vinyl Lovers, on Facebook. In this series of videos, I think we're going to have about three, I asked Michael to just talk in length about his favorite recordings on vinyl purely for their sound. And he cut across a wide a uh, swath of genres and uh, record cutters and producers and bands and continents. So I hope you get a kick out of this video. I know I did. So we're all enjoying our lockdown, aren't we? Uh, I'm not enjoying the lockdown, but we have to do it. So it's always good to have a lot of records and a good stereo so you can just sit around and enjoy yourself, which I'm doing. And also, this is a good time to take the opportunity, if you have the time, to start doing some exercise. I'm, I'm a proselytizer for exercise. I've whipped myself into shape. And I don't care how old you are, you can be old and you can be in shape. If you're my age, I, I prove it. 73, man, 45 push-ups. I'm good. I've never felt better in my life. So when I sit and listen to music, I feel better. Okay, I can't hear a thing anymore, but that, that's not a problem because I look good. That's all I care about. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay, so you know, I, uh, um, I found this. This is really interesting. I was going through my archives, which are not nearly as well kept as Neil Young's archives because they're just pieces of paper that I found lying around. This is a little featurette called Overlooked Treasures that I wrote in 1971 that was in uh, the Boston Phoenix, which was the underground new, you know, a lot of people came out of the Boston Phoenix in the real paper. Joe Klein, uh, John Landau, I mean, a lot of people came out of there. I did too, but they all made big, oh, you did too? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so, so my overlooked treasures were Ogden's Nut Gun Flight by uh, Small Faces, which is gonna be in here and I'll show you that. Sir John Alotta by John Renburn, which I didn't take out, which I should have, so I'll take it out now, because it's right here. There you go. Okay, well, I'll show that later. Um, six and 12 string guitar by Leo Kotke, which I didn't take out. Song Cycle by Van Dyke Parks, which I did take out. Uh, Winds of Change by Peter Frampton. This is Peter Frampton's first solo record uh, after he left Humble Pie, mm -hmm. and he hadn't become Peter Frampton yet, and he, he had the band Camel right at that point in time. So, and then Big mm -hmm. Star number one album, which my one of my 16 year old writers just reviewed uh, the Kraft reissue of it uh, on Analog Planet, uh, Nathan Zeller, my, my second young writer. And it was so great because I found that, I wrote about number one record in 1971 uh, mm. and I said, I hated being 18, but this group heavily influenced by the English rock made me wish I was 18 again. It was, it's just cool that 16 year old likes this record. McGinnis Flint, uh, the 2000 year old man, Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks. I don't know why I put that in there and River Deep Mountain High, uh, which was uh, Ike and Tina Turner. So those are my overlooked treasures. And then um, I also found, I got into this big British record thing back then, and I found this. So at the back, you look at the back sometimes more interesting than the front. So the back has an ad for the group Bread at the Boston Musical. Tickets were four, five, and six dollars. And may, many of you were saying, it's bread. I wouldn't pay four or five, six dollars now to see bread, but okay. Uh, and then this one has uh, Jonathan Edwards in concert at Jordan Hall. He was a big Boston guy. He did that song, Sunshine Go Away Today. All right, so let's get to great sounding records in my collection. So here's the John Renborn. This is for John a lot of, and this is, this is recorded by John Wood at Sound Techniques in London. A lot of great records came out of this tiny studio called Sound Techniques. Uh, Richard Thompson, Fairport Convention, Nick Drake, amazing records came out of this little studio. And this is one of them. And this is one of my favorite solo guitar with uh, percussion accompaniment. There's an American pressing of this, don't get it. 
it's on, it's on uh, reprise. They decided that the kids couldn't deal with an unvarnished, beautifully recorded guitar, so they added uh, reverb to it. And it, it just ruin, ruined it. And then there was a digital version of it by Wyndham, Wyndham Hill did a digital version of it that some people think sounds great. That's because they haven't heard this version. This is the only one. So I have my, this is not my original. My original I have here that I've been playing since 1969. This one I got at Amoeba. It was up on the wall, and I figured, mm. all right, because I, I had seen it in London a couple of years ago for 60, 80 bucks. I didn't want to spend that. It was 20 bucks, and it was mint. So I bought it. I love this record. I played this record for people, and they just flip out. So this is the group Talk Talk, and some people confuse this with the song Talk Talk by the Music Machine, but no, this is the group Talk Talk, and they confuse Talk Talk with a, a disco group. And this group started out doing kind of disco-y stuff. But this record is uh, absolutely spectacular sonically and musically. It's kind of like a cerebral Roxy music. He's, he sounds a little bit like Brian Ferry, but just a little bit. The production of this record almost gave everybody um, mental illness, the engineer, Phil Brown, who I interviewed, you can see the interview with Phil Brown. He did uh, Traffic and a whole bunch of other groups. He was a great engineer. He still is. I think he's retired, though. I went up to his, uh, I took a two-hour train ride when I was in the UK, and I interviewed him in his little flat, and he's got all kinds of great memorabilia on the wall. Huh. And uh, this is, now this record's worth a lot of money. Uh, it's hard to find it. And they're trying to get it reissued, but... A good reissue from tape hasn't been done yet. I hope it does get done. If you've ever heard this record, if, it, if you can stream it, check it out. This is an original uh, British pressing, made in Holland, but, but you know, it was the Brit British Parlophone pressing. And the record store in Sweden where I bought it wasn't aware of its value, so I got it at a really, really good price. It's very costly at this point in time. Very cerebral, beautiful, in, uh, inspirational music. Okay, then I pulled out the very famous uh, Louis Armstrong Sashmo plays King Oliver. I'm sure many of you know this record. Uh, Classic Records did a reissue. Chad's done a reissue. The tape that they used, I'm not sure what, whether it was a third generation tape or a second generation tape, but uh, this is from the original tape. And this is a single microphone MS recording, so it's a single point microphone. And the story behind this is uh, Louis and, and the group were in, I think, radio recorders. In, in California, and they were doing something else, and somehow they got roped into going into another studio and just laying down these tracks. Hmm. And uh, if you've ever heard this record, it's like Lewis is back alive, standing right in your room. It's it's astonishing. And these pressings were not the greatest, but I happened to get a get a good one actually. So, and of course I kept the inner the inner bag, the inner Audio Fidelity bag. Keep everything. All right, so let's see what I got next. Uh, this is backwards to me. So then I, oh, then I have a, this is a, the original British pressing of it, mm. but it was mastered in America. The date of the mastering is on it, and the same with the, with the original America, and the date of the mastering is scribed right on it. Isn't that considered the first audiophile label? Is that true? The first Audio stereo. They, they, they produced the first stereo records. Oh. And I've got a lot of their demo or a lot of the Dukes of Dixieland and and um, you know hy hyperdermic needle sound effects records <laughs> yeah they're a pretty crazy pr pretty crazy bunch huh. and th this is just a really <clears throat> cool packaging so wow and it sounds a little bit better than the American because their pressing quality was better and their uh, the vinyl there was better you know it was better so this is Sticky Fingers everybody knows Sticky Fingers and it was never a great sounding record it was okay but there is a special pressing that actually is the best pressing. The mobile fidelity is not good. They they boosted the bass stupidly. You know, I'm, I, I loved Stan Rickery. He was a great guy. But Stan was a bass player. So <laughs> guess what happened? Stan would master something. And say, I need to turn the bass up a little bit. And there's just some of those records, like the Asia that was released by Mobile Fidelity, stupid amounts of bass. And the Sticky Fingers, stupid amounts of bass. So the American one is okay. This one is... One that Doug Sachs mastered. When I don't know how this exactly happened, but somehow uh, for European distribution, the tape went to Doug Sachs instead of whoever did it at Atlantic Studios. And so there's a tiny little TML in here, the mastering lab. It's not the stamp. This is before Doug Sachs even had the stamp TML. So it's just a T period, M period, L period. And it's in there. And you can find these. People don't know that much about 
this record. Now they will, and it'll become costly. But I was at Disc Union in Japan, and I asked if they had one, and they had one, and they, they knew what it was. So they said, yeah, $250. Actually, that was the wrong accent. That was a Chinese accent. The right accent is, oh, $250. You know, you're not supposed to... You're not supposed to do accents anymore. It's out. Of, it's it's no longer uh, it's it's no longer PC. But I don't care. I love doing accents. So at this union, it was it was uh, this two hundred fifty dollar record, and it was it'd be worth it. But I won't spend two fifty for a record. If I was in Taiwan and I found it, two fifty dollar. If if you have a problem with that, I'm sorry, but I don't. I love making fun of myself and funny accents and too bad. Okay. So if you find a TML, it'll be a German pressing. I've seen these on Discogs for not that much money. This one I found, I went to visit Chad Kassam. He didn't know about this. Chad knows everything about every record you've ever heard of or don't have not, never heard of. He didn't know about this one. And I went through his records and found a TML. I said, you know, this is a TML. Hey, what do you mean TML? That's Doug Sachs. I said, Doug Sachs cut a copy of Sticky Fingers. So that's a, that's a British copy or a US? It's a German. German. Oh. The, the British may also have be the same one, but oh. I, the German is definitely the one. Huh. Okay, so if you want a, the best copy of Sticky Fingers, and certainly the ones that are out now has to be mastered from files that have been compressed. To, they're not very good. Did I pull this out last time? I, mm. Sounds obscene. So this is uh, Sam Records, which is a French label has been doing these wonderful reissues, all from original master tapes, all cut the right way. All these French records of Barclay and other uh, labels from France that produced wonderful records with many American artists who were either traveling through Europe with groups or exiled themselves to Europe because they didn't like living here in the 50s and I don't blame any of them. And so this one is a combination of Connie Kay, Percy Heath, Kenny Clark, basically the modern jazz quartet, with John Lewis and Sasha Distel, who was who was a uh, a, a uh, young at this point young guitarist in uh, in Paris, and it's just a wonderful. These are mostly monophonic records, but beautiful packaging, fold over sleeves when appropriate, great um, artwork, and you get. And the guy that did these reissues knew the original photographer who's still alive and gets the negatives and there's a, a beautiful reproduction of, of the cover inside of the Sam Records. They're all worth getting. If you can find them, they, they go out of print pretty quickly. Beautiful mono recording. I, I tell people now, if something's in print, don't hesitate. It's not going to be in print forever. Get it now. You know, Find the money somehow. It's, it's only going to go up in value. You know, it used to be you buy a record, it was worth nothing after a while. Now, I have records here that I thought were dollar records. They're $100 records. I'm curious, what's your take on the Record Store Day records? Some of them are really great, and yeah, there's a limited pressings. Yeah, and... there's a whole different market of it. I don't get involved in that. I'm not, I'm not a record flipper. I'm not a, I don't invest in records. And a lot of that stuff, I don't get involved. I see what goes on with those records. People get them, and immediately they put them on, on eBay and Discogs for huge amounts of money. And there are collectors who collect just to collect, and just to have rare, I, I've never been in that category or that camp. I'm not interested in it. So, but whatever, whatever gets people to buy records, I'm all, I'm all for it. I don't care if you don't play them and just hang them on the wall. Whatever, that's stupid. But if that's what you want to do, just as long as you keep buying records, supporting the record stores, I'm good. To your ears, is there a general consistent difference between a 45 and a 33 reissue of the same record? Uh, it's difficult in the sense that often someone already locked up the 33 and a third version of it and the only thing they can get is the 45 version of it so that's why it only comes out of it. and people complain about that but they can't get it at any other speed you know there's a label called four men with beards you know that label really good musical taste crappy records cut from cds you, i've got a bunch of them you can hear it it's just a cd put on a record and they're terrible but they have good taste so they lock up these titles for like 10 years and nobody else could get a tape version out Unless they say, I'll do it at 45. Then they can skirt around the licensing. But do you hear a difference, like the Music Matters 45 versus the 33? The 45 sounds better. Yeah, huh. it's like a tape running at 15 is better than seven and a half. Larger and also, grooves, is that it? Well, you're not cutting as far into the record, so it's consistently better all the way in. As, as you go in, you know, the grooves get scrunched up. The waveforms get, so the high frequencies kind of roll off slightly. Yeah. This way, everything, every track you play sounds great. Right. I know people say, I don't want to get up every 10 minutes. You know what? Most of the people I know in this business need to get up every 10 minutes. 
They really need to get up every five minutes, but 10 will be good. You know, it's like, I don't want to get up every 10 minutes. Get real, you know? Okay. So, I'm offending so many people, I love it. This is XTC's English Settlement. This is such a great record. It's a, the English version is a two record set. And it's the sonically spectacular, it was cut at Townhouse. And uh, I love it, the textured cover. Yeah, textured cover. Beautiful. And I, I wrote about this in a, in, a, in a recent review. I did too. The better my stereo has gotten, the more I understand this record. There's so much bass on this, good bass. There's so much energy on this race a ba record. I had an opinion of this record that was totally wrong. I always heard it as being uh, bass going like on no, no thugs and ours, boom, boom, but it's not that way. It's clean. It's just, it's this as opposed to this. But my turntable, up until recently, I swear, until recently, could not handle the energy on this record. Now it's like, and all of the high frequencies, all the bells and things are just, it's, it's amazing. So there's a reissue that uh, Andy Partridge is definitely an audio oriented guy. And so the reissue that was done on this, a double, I think it's two record set, he put the whole thing out. Oh. Uh, supposedly it sounds really, really great, but I have two pressings of the original, which sounds so good, so I'm, I'm not gonna replace it. I was supposed to interview him, Andy Partridge. I actually got him on the phone. He was playing the Palladium in London uh, in uh, in California, and then he had a nervous breakdown that night, and, really? and I couldn't interview him. But wow. anyway, or I had the nervous breakdown. One of us, one of us had a nervous breakdown. I'm not sure which. This is uh, one of my favorite favorite records. So this is Peter Townsend and Ronnie Lane Rough Mix. This record, it's like semi obscure. I don't know why people don't know this record. It's produced and engineered by Glenn Johns. Okay, do you need to know much more? This was mastered by Doug Sachs at the Mastering Lab because uh, Peter Townsend likes all of his things done by Doug Sachs when he was alive. He can't do much with it now. And this is a wonderful acoustic, it's an acoustic record. Beautiful tunes, it's got mm. Street in the City with strings. And there's an American version also cut by Doug Sachs. And what's interesting is if you compare the two versions, both cut by Doug. This one was plated and pressed in the UK, the American one by MCA. They sound completely different. Mm. This one is so much better. And Classic Records reissued this uh, and did a great job with it. And they didn't have a jacket, so they asked me to send one of my copies. Oh. So let me see if I have that one. Oh. So this is my other copy. So this copy has a last sticker on it. See the last sticker? Mm -hmm. rec last is the record preserver. <clears throat> so I, I, I lent this copy to them. I wasn't looking. If you buy the classic record reissue, it's got the last st sticker on it. You can't peel yours off, but... <laughs> It's just one of those funny little things. Highly recommended record. Even the, get the American one if that's all you can find. They're, in, they're cheap. Nobody, no, nobody loves this record. It's beautifully recorded and it's just wonderful acoustic songs. Original Who, quick one. These are very raw primitive recordings in mono. And the American MCA is fantastic also if you can find one of these in mono. This is the original British reaction pressing. But it's got Boris the Spider, uh, Heat Wave, Run, 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 So Sad About Us, great song, Whiskey Man, um, Quick One While He's Away, great record. The American one on MCA is, is it's, an, it's a real knockout. And it's funny because there was a garage sale and uh, I used to go to garage sales a lot. I just don't have time anymore and I don't need any more records. I just don't. And so I got in my car and I, I just, something made me want to go to this garage sale. Down the block, I could have walked there. And there was a mint original MCA copy for a bucket. It's, it sounds, I was going to pull that one out. It sounds, if you can find that. Hmm. I bet you that's expensive though. Everything, everything's expensive. But, okay, here's an original British Mr. Fantasy by Traffic. Oh, wow. This is the original cover. Okay. So it's got Dave Mason in the picture and Dave Mason quit the band at that point and right after the group that's why if you look at the American version it's only got three people because he quit but he's on here and this is Eddie Kramer <coughs> engineered this and Olympic Studios and uh, that's gotta be pricey pink label island <clears throat> these are like these are like orgasmic orgasmic and you know I've been playing this record since 1969 it's still in great shape. And if I played this for you, and you're, I think you can stream this now on any of the streaming services, 
this just no comparison between this and what you stream. Because it takes up too much space. Literally, you know, it sounds like it's one little sleeve. And then you gotta, t I don't know, you know, in all honesty, I'm not, you know, Craig Kalman came down here, the CEO of Atlantic Records. He's a fanatical record, and he's like worse than anybody I know, or better, depending on how you look at it. So Craig has like multiple collections. He's got one collection, it's his archival collection. I think it's it's stored in, in Christie's or one of these auction houses in the basement. Temperature, you know, it's, and every record in that is mint. It is perfect mint. So I don't, he came down here once, I, he looked around, I could tell he was, he couldn't hide his face strapped. It was like, oh my God, look at this. You know, the records are all great. Some of the jackets aren't so great anymore. They're played. I, I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not anally retentive. I'm not. About the quality of the records, about caring for the records, yes. But the jackets, they're worn, they're used the jackets, and if I put one of those sleeves, and you know what else, those things are dangerous sometimes with the sticky thing. Oh, I hate those things. Yeah, those with the sticky the thing, it can, the, it sticks to the paper, Horrific. and then you're screwed, then, yeah. then you ruin a record. That's right. So, hate no, I don't put these in. And the laminated ones aren't mm. as, they don't get ring wear pretty much, so I love when these videos go, clean your room, man, clean your room. Well, you know what, this is, this is a workspace. Yeah. It's a crazy workspace. I do clean my room every so often, and then it takes a couple of days for it to get like this because 50 records show up. Where am I supposed to put them? Stuff shows up. Anyway. I'm <laughs> curious, either on the off, off the records, up to you. So is the Kermis, if you do the insane 20-minute, is it better? It is better. than If you have a record that you've cleaned a lot over decades, and you do go through that whole thing and get start seeing the white paste and all the sugar. I, he, look, the guys, there's no sugar in your records. I'm sorry. There's no sugar in there, there's no xylitol, there's you know, there's no wheatgrass, nothing. But there's there are definite stuff that gets embedded in the record. You clean it with a fluid and you dry dry it with a machine. It's blowing it dry, but in the drying process, there's a residue left. You know, if you take your record after you've cleaned it on a machine and then you give it a rinse of just distilled water and then dry it, you have a much better chance of not having a residue. But over the years, like like this is an original Oh, this is not original. You can see anybody. If I took the sense in my original, they go, "There's no numbers there. He's a faker. He's a lawyer. He's a wanker." That's the wrong one. <laughs>